Into the Wild by John Krakauer. Chapter 3. Carthage. I wanted movement and not a calm course of existence. I wanted excitement and danger and the chance to sacrifice myself for my love. I felt in myself a superabundance of energy which found no outlet in our quiet life. Leo Tolstoy from Family Happiness, a passage highlighted in one of the books found with Chris McCandless's remains. It should not be denied that being footloose has always exhilarated us. It is associated in our minds with escape from history and oppression and law and irksome obligations with absolute freedom, and the road has always led west. Wallace Stegner, The American West as Living Space. Carthage, South Dakota, population 274, is a sleepy little cluster of clapboard houses with tidy yards and weathered brick storefronts rising humbly from the immensity of the northern plains, set adrift in time. Stately rows of cottonwood shade a grid of streets seldom disturbed by moving vehicles. There's only one grocery in town, one bank, a single gas station, a lone bar, the cabaret, where Wayne Westerberg is sipping a cocktail and chewing on a sweet cigar, remembering the odd young man he knew as Alex. The cabaret's plywood-paneled walls are hung with deer antlers, old Milwaukee beer promos, and mawkish paintings of game birds taking flight. Tendrils of cigarette smoke rise from the clumps of farmers in overalls and dusty feed caps, their tired faces as grimy as coal miners. Speaking in short, matter-of-fact phrases, they worry aloud over the fickle weather and fields of sunflowers still too wet to cut, while above their heads, Ross Perot's sneering visage flickers across a silent television screen. In eight days, the nation will elect Bill Clinton as president. It's been nearly two months now since the body of Chris McCandless turned up in Alaska. These are what Alex used to drink, says Westerberg with a frown, swirling the ice in his white Russian. He used to sit right there at the end of the bar and tell us these amazing stories of his travels. He could talk for hours. A lot of folks here in town got pretty attached to old Alex. Kind of a strange deal what happened to him. Westerberg, a hyperkinetic man with thick shoulders and a black goatee, owns a grain elevator in Carthage and another one a few miles out of town, but spends every summer running a custom combine crew that follows the harvest from Texas north to the Canadian border. In the fall of 1990, he was wrapping up the season in north-central Montana, cutting barley for cores in Anheuser-Busch. On the afternoon of September 10th, driving out of Cutbank after buying some parts for a malfunctioning combine, he pulled over for a hitchhiker, an amiable kid who said his name was Alex McCandless. McCandless was smallish with the hard, stringy physique of an itinerant laborer. There was something arresting about the youngster's eyes, dark and emotive, they suggested a trace of exotic blood in his heritage, Greek maybe, or Chippewa, and conveyed a vulnerability that made Westerberg want to take the kid under his wing. He had the kind of sensitive good looks that women made a big fuss over, Westerberg imagined. His face had a strange elasticity. It would be slack and expressionless one minute, only to twist suddenly into a gaping oversized grin that distorted his features and exposed a mouthful of horsey teeth. He was nearsighted and wore steel-rimmed glasses. He looked hungry. Ten minutes after picking up McCandless, Westerberg stopped in the town of Etheridge to deliver a package to a friend. He offered us both a beer, says Westberg, and asked Alex how long it had been since he ate. Alex allowed how it had been a couple of days, said he'd kind of run out of money. Overhearing this, the friend's wife insisted on cooking Alex a big dinner, which he wolfed down and then fell asleep at the table. McCandless had told Westerberg that his destination was Saco Hot Springs, 240 miles to the east on U.S. Highway 2, a place he'd heard about from some rubber tramps, as in vagabonds who owned a vehicle, as distinguished from leather tramps who lacked personal transportation and were thus forced to hitchhike or walk. Westerberg had replied that he could take McCandless only 10 miles down the road, at which point he would be turning north towards Sunburst, where he kept a trailer near the fields he was cutting. By the time Westerberg steered over to the shoulder to drop McCandless off, it was 10.30 at night and raining hard. Geez, Westerberg told him, I hate to leave you out here in the goddamn rain. You got a sleeping bag? Why don't you come on up to Sunburst, spend the night in the trailer? McCandless stayed with Westerberg for three days, riding 
with his crew each morning as the workers piloted their lumbering machines across the ocean of ripe blonde grain. Before McCandless and Westerberg went their separate ways, Westerberg told the young man to look him up in Carthage if he ever needed a job. It was only a couple weeks that went by before Alex showed up in town, Westerberg remembers. He gave McCandless employment at the grain elevator and rented him a cheap room in one of the two houses he owned. I've given jobs to lots of hitchhikers over the years, says Westerberg. Most of them weren't much good. Didn't really want to work. It was a different story with Alex. He was the hardest worker I've ever seen. Didn't matter what it was, he'd do it. Hard physical labor, mucking rotten grain and dead rats out of the bottom of the hole. Jobs where you'd get so damn dirty you couldn't even tell what you look like at the end of the day. And he'd never quit in the middle of something. If he started a job, he'd finish it. It was almost like a moral thing for him. He was what you'd call extremely ethical. He set pretty high standards for himself. You could tell right away that Alex was intelligent, Westberg reflects, draining his third drink. He read a lot, used a lot of big words. I think maybe part of what got him into trouble was that he did too much thinking. Sometimes he tried too hard to make sense of the world, to figure out why people were bad to each other so often. A couple of times I tried to tell him it was a mistake to get too deep into that kind of stuff. But Alex got stuck on things. He always had to know the absolute right answer before he could go on to the next thing. At one point, Westerberg discovered from a tax form that McCandless's real name was Chris, not Alex. He never explained why he'd change his name, says Westerberg. From things he said, you could tell something wasn't right between him and his family, but I don't like to pry into other people's business, so I never asked about it. If McCandless felt estranged from his parents and siblings, he found a surrogate family in Westerberg and his employees, most of whom lived in Westerberg's Carthage home, a few blocks from the center of town. It is a simple two-story Victorian in the Queen Anne style with a big cottonwood towering over the front yard. The living arrangements were loose and convivial. The four or five inhabitants took turns cooking for one another, went drinking together, and chased women together without success. McCandless quickly became enamored of Carthage. He liked the community stasis and plebeian virtues and un unassuming mien. The place was a, black, a back eddy, a pool of jets and beyond the pull of the main current, and that suited him just fine. That fall, he developed a lasting bond with both the town and Wayne Westerberg. Westerberg, in his mid-thirties, was brought to Carthage as a young boy by adoptive parents. A renaissance man of the plains, he is a farmer, welder, businessman, machinist, ace mechanic, commodity speculator, licensed airplane pilot, computer programmer, electronics troubleshooter, video game repairman. Shortly before he met McCandless, however, one of his talents had got him in trouble with the law. Westerberg had been drawn into a scheme to build and sell black boxes which illegally unscramble satellite television transmissions allowing people to watch encrypted cable programming without paying for it. The FBI caught wind of this, set up a sting, and arrested Westerberg. Contrite, he copped a plea to a single felony count, and on October 10, 1990, some two weeks after McCandless arrived in Carthage, began serving a four-month sentence in Sioux Falls. With Westerberg in stir, there was no work at the grain elevator for McCandless, so on October 23rd, Sooner than he might have under different circumstances, the boy left town and resumed a nomadic existence. The attachment McCandless felt for Carthage remained powerful, however. Before departing, he gave Westerberg a treasured 1942 edition of Tolstoy's War and Peace. On the title page, he inscribed, Transferred to Wayne Westerberg from Alexander, October 1990. Listen to Pierre. The latter is a reference to Tolstoy's protagonist and alter eagle, Pierre Bezuov, altruistic, questing, illegitimately born. And McCandless stayed in touch with Westerberg as he roamed the West, calling or writing Carthage every month or two. He had all his mail forwarded to Westerberg's address and told almost everyone he met thereafter that South Dakota was his home. In truth, McCandless had been raised in the comfortable upper-middle-class environs of Annandale, Virginia, his father, Walt, is an eminent aerospace engineer who designed advanced radar systems for the space shuttle and other high-profile projects, 
while in the employ of NASA and Hughes Aircraft in the 1960s and 70s. In 1978, Walt went into business for himself, launching a small but eventually prosperous consulting firm, User Systems Incorporated. His partner in the venture was Chris's mother, Billy. There were eight children in the extended family, a younger sister, Corrine, with whom Chris was extremely close, and six half-brothers and sisters from Walt's first marriage. In May 1990, Chris graduated from Emory University, Atlanta, where he'd been a columnist for and editor of the student newspaper, The Emory Wheel. He had distinguished himself as a history and anthropology major with a 3.72 grade point average. He was offered membership in Phi Beta Kappa, but declined, insisting that titles and honors are irrelevant. The final two years of his college education had been paid for with a $40,000 bequest left by a friend of the family's. More than $24,000 remained at the time of Chris's graduation, money his parents thought he intended to use for law school. We misread him, his father admits. What Walt, Billy, and Corrine didn't know when they flew down to Atlanta to attend Chris's commencement was n- what nobody knew was that he would shortly donate all the money in his college fund to Oxfam America, a charity dedicated to fighting hunger. The graduation ceremony was on May 12th, a Saturday. The family sat through a long-winded commencement address delivered by Secretary of Labor Elizabeth Dole, and then Billy snapped pictures of a grinning Chris traversing the stage to receive his diploma. The next day was Mother's Day. Chris gave Billy candy, flowers, a sentimental card. She was surprised and extremely touched. It was the first present she had received from her son in more than two years, since he had announced to his parents that, on principle, he would no longer give or accept gifts. Indeed, Chris had only recently upbraided Walt and Billy for expressing their desire to buy him a new car as a graduation present and offering to pay for law school if there wasn't enough money left in his college fund to cover it. He already had a perfectly good car, he insisted. A beloved 1982 Datsun B210, slightly dented but mechanically sound, with 128,000 miles on the odometer. I can't believe they'd try and buy me a car, he later complained to Kareem. Or that they'd think I'd actually let them pay for my law school if I was going to go. I've told them a million times that I have the best car in the world, a car that has spanned the continent from Miami to Alaska. A car that has in all those thousands of miles not given me a single problem. A car that I will never trade in. A car that I am very strongly attached to. Yet they ignore what I say and think I'd actually accept a new car from them. I'm going to have to be real careful not to accept any gifts from them in the future. Because they will think they have bought my respect. Chris had purchased the second-hand yellow Datsun when he was a senior in high school. In the years since... He'd been in the habit of taking it on extended solo road trips when classes weren't in session. And during that graduation weekend, he casually mentioned to his parents that he intended to spend the upcoming summer on the road as well. His exact words were, I think I'm going to disappear for a while. Neither parent made anything of this announcement at the time, although Walt did gently admonish his son saying, Hey, make sure you come see us before you go. Chris smiled and sort of nodded, a response that Walt and Billy took as an affirmation that he would visit them in in Annandale before the summer was out. And then they said their goodbyes. Toward the end of June, Chris, still in Atlanta, mailed his parents a copy of his final grade report, A in Apartheid in South African Society and History of Anthropological Thought. A- minus in Contemporary African Politics and the Food Crisis in Africa. A brief note was attached. Here is a copy of my final transcript. Grade-wise, things went pretty well, and I ended up with a high cumulative average. Thank you for the pictures, the shaving gear, and the postcard from Paris. It seems that you really enjoyed your trip there. It must have been a lot of fun. I gave Lloyd, Chris's closest friend at Emory, his picture, and he was very grateful. He did not have a shot of his diploma getting handed to him. Not much else happening, but it's starting to get real hot and humid down here. Say hi to everyone for me. It was the last anyone in Chris's family would ever hear from him. During that final year in Atlanta, 
Chris had lived off campus in a monkish room furnished with little more than a thin mattress on the floor, milk crates, and a table. He kept it as orderly and spotless as a military barracks, and he didn't have a phone, so Walt and Billy had no way of calling him. By the beginning of August 1990, Chris's parents had heard nothing from their son since they'd received his grades in the mail, so they decided to drive down to Atlanta for a visit. When they arrived at his apartment, it was empty and a for-rent sign was taped to the window. The manager said that Chris had moved out at the end of June. Walt and Billy returned home to find that all of the letters they'd sent their son that summer had been returned in a bundle. Chris had instructed the post office to hold them until August 1st, apparently so we wouldn't know anything was up, says Billy. It made us very, very worried. By then, Chris was long gone. Five weeks earlier, he'd loaded all his belongings into his little car and headed west without an itinerary. The trip was to be an odyssey in the fullest sense of the word, an epic journey that would change everything. He had spent the previous four years, as he saw it, preparing to fulfill an absurd and onerous duty to graduate from college. At long last, he was unencumbered, emancipated from the stifling world of his parents and peers, a world of abstraction and security and material excess, a world in which he felt grievously cut off from the raw throb of existence. Driving west out of Atlanta, he intended to invent an utterly new life for himself, one in which he would be free to wallow in unfiltered experience. To symbolize the complete severance from his previous life, he even adopted a new name. No longer would he answer to Chris McCandless. He was now Alexander Supertramp, master of his own destiny.